Hello, my name is John Tsai from the UCI School of Medicine and the Division of Nephrology. Today I'll be talking about managing dialysis in the clinical setting and some complications that we see with patients on dialysis. I'll also go over the different dialysis modalities that we have available to us, and finally talk about conservative management for patients that elect like not to go on dialysis. Firstly, I wanted to go over the nomenclature that we use and the differences between chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease, or ESRD. Chronic kidney disease and its stages are primarily used for individuals who are not yet on dialysis. For example, this patient here with an estimated glomerular infiltration rate of 14 has stage 5 chronic kidney disease, which is defined as an EGFR less than 15. Once this patient eventually transitions to dialysis, only at that time do we consider this patient to have end-stage renal disease, or ESRD. The acronyms ESRD and ESKD can be used interchangeably, though ESKD is now the more favored term. When we talk about the management of dialysis patients, it is important to remember that dialysis patients should be treated the same as other patients when it comes to medical conditions that are not renally related. For example, in this patient with a pneumonia, please treat the pneumonia first. The only difference in dialysis patients is that if a patient stays long enough in the hospital, they will eventually require their dialysis session or else electrolyte derangements begin to arise. To help us to more rapidly expedite the care we provide as a renal consulting service, please let us know if you think a dialysis patient will need dialysis in a timely manner. Additionally, it is helpful if you can provide the patient's dialysis access information and when they last got dialysis to help us triage the patient. Ordering a chemistry panel can also help us to determine if emergent dialysis needs or if the patient needs uh, or are less urgent. We can use the mnemonic AEIOU to help us remember the acute indications for dialysis. A refers to a metabolic acidosis that is resistant to medications. E refers to electrolyte abnormalities, especially hyperkalemia or hypercalcemia. I refers to any ingestions that are dialyzable. O refers to volume overload for patients who are not responsive to diuretics. And U refers to the uremic symptoms that patients can have once they develop severe renal failure. It is common to see patients start to develop uremic symptoms once the EGFR gets below 12. It is also important to note that there is not one specific acute indication that will determine the need for dialysis, but rather it is a general clinical picture of a patient as well as the laboratory tests that determine a patient's need for dialysis. While we have dialysis nurses available to perform dialysis almost 24 seven here at UCI, there is limited staff in the evenings and Sundays, which may require medical management of patients to bridge them to their next dialysis treatment. This can include the provision of potassium binders, such as Kaxlate, Veltasa, or Localma to manage hyperkalemic patients prior to their next dialysis session. Additionally, for patients who are not yet on dialysis, it may take some time for a dialysis catheter to be placed and for the dialysis machine to be ready. In such cases, medical management may inevitably be faster and more appropriate in the interim. When in doubt, please don't hesitate to call us. Before we talk more about dialysis, I wanted to discuss some complications to end-stage renal disease that we frequently see both in patients and in the outpatient clinic. In kidney failure, it is not unusual that multiple organ systems have derangements since the kidneys are an integral part of blood pressure management, anemia management, electrolyte management, and metabolic bone disease. First, let's talk about volume management in dialysis patients. When patients have a normal kidney function, whatever fluid that is ingested is usually excreted through the kidneys. However, when there's no kidney function, or if the kidney function is impaired, the ability to excrete excess fluids and free water is also impaired. Dialysis patients invariably have individual variation of how much fluid they can handle without becoming symptomatic, a factor that is usually dependent upon a patient's size and residual urine output. However, this means that most dialysis patients will eventually become volume overloaded if additional strategies to remove the excess fluid are not done in a timely manner. In addition to dialysis for volume removal, we can also give dialysis patients loop diuretics to help manage any excess volume that a patient may have, especially in the setting where a patient has any residual urine output. Once a patient becomes anuric, diuretics are not usually useful and can typically be discontinued. 
Many patients on dialysis do have high blood pressure, usually as a side effect of volume overload. It is not unusual that a patient's blood pressures are very high prior to dialysis, but normalize or drop to hypotensive ranges during and after the dialysis treatment with sufficient volume removal. This means that blood pressure management is slightly more relaxed compared to non-dialysis patients to allow for variations to occur around the dialysis treatment. Studies have shown that blood pressures during the interdialytic interval or on non-dialysis days are typically those that have the best correlation with outcomes, which means that we should really be targeting average blood pressures on non-dialysis days when we are adjusting or adding any new blood pressure medications. What types of blood pressure medications are reasonable for patients on dialysis? Well, actually, most blood pressure medications remain helpful in dialysis patients, including diuretics and RAS inhibitors. If we are finding that blood pressures are rising after dialysis, we can review the patient's blood pressures and possibly consider the dialyzability of some of these medications that can contribute to elevated blood pressures post-dialysis when we typically expect lower blood pressures. Anemia is also very common in dialysis patients due to the lack of erythropoietin production that normally happens in patients with normal kidney function. It is important to note that our hemoglobin goals when treating dialysis patients with erythropoietin stimulating agents or ESAs is lower than normal. Studies have shown that higher hemoglobin levels above 12 tend to result in a higher risk of stroke and thromboembolism compared to the lower hemoglobin level goal of 9 to 11. One should always rule out more common causes of anemia, such as GI bleeding and vitamin deficiencies, before attributing somebody's anemia to chronic kidney disease, as these continue to remain prevalent in the dialysis population. In addition to ESAs, we can also provide IV iron to dialysis patients through the dialysis machine, which helps us to manage patients' anemia and prevent the need for more expensive blood transfusions in the future. Now let's discuss electrolyte management and how dialysis actually works to correct somebody's electrolyte issues. First, let's discuss management of these two different scenarios, which you may have come across during your practice. On the left, we have a dialysis patient that is coding and incidentally has a potassium of 7.8. If you are actively coding a patient, it is important to remember that dialysis will be unlikely to save this patient from their code and medical management will be the faster and preferred method of resuscitation at lowering the patient's potassium. Once resuscitation is complete, please feel free to call us to arrange for emergent dialysis. On the right, we have an outpatient dialysis patient with a high potassium level of 7.8. Before freaking out, it is important to ask yourself if this was an incidental finding and when the lab was drawn in relation to their last dialysis session. Most of the time, the patients have already received their next dialysis treatment or are about to receive their dialysis treatment, in which case the abnormal lab value becomes a moot point. Almost invariably, the causes of hyperkalemia in dialysis patients are either a missed dialysis session, dietary indiscretions, or both. Reviewing medications and ensuring none, of, none that can cause hyperkalemia, such as Bactrim, is also helpful. If a patient has not yet had their dialysis session, arranging for dialysis or medical management would be the next appropriate management step of these patients. It is also helpful to remember that since dialysis patients are frequently exposed to hyperkalemia, they have a much higher tolerance to hyperkalemia compared to individuals with normal kidney function. So here is how dialysis works through the principles of diffusion and convection. In dialysis, we typically run blood across a semi-permeable membrane across a fluid known as a dialysate. Usually one side will have a higher concentration of the substance compared to the other, and through diffusion, the molecules in the higher concentration side will move to the lower concentration side until the two of them are equal concentration. We use a counter current mechanism in the dialyzer and run the blood and the dialysis at relatively rapid rates to increase the efficiency of this process. In addition, we can exert a pressure across that semi-permeable membrane in a process known as convection that will help us mostly drive fluid and some solute across that semi-permeable membrane. The process of convection, which is also known as ultrafiltration, is the main way we remove excess volume from a patient over time. All of our dialysis machines, including peritoneal dialysis, involve some combination of diffusion and convection to varying degrees. So what are the components of the dialysis bath that we use? It is usually split into what is known as the acid bath and the base bath. In the acid bath, 
are most of our cations that we are trying to adjust, while in our base bath usually consists of sodium bicarbonate that we can use to correct a patient's acid-base disturbance. While you can see that there are many different components, we can only usually adjust the potassium, the calcium, and the bicarbonate levels through pre-made manufactured dialysate fluids. So while we can correct all electrolytes to more normal levels, we usually only have the ability to fine tune potassium, calcium, and bicarbonate levels with dialysis. When somebody is started on dialysis or receives a dialysis treatment, it is important to remember that dialysis replaces somebody's kidney function and does not make their underlying kidneys better. The three main functions of the kidney are replaced by physical principles of diffusion and convection across that semipermeable membrane that we use for dialysis. While some patients in acute kidney injury can improve their kidney function over time through the healing process, dialysis does not assist in this healing process, but only allows for a better milieu for the body to heal itself over time. As you may be aware, we tend to order a lot of labs for dialysis patients, and some that may not, you may not necessarily be aware of. As part of management of chronic kidney disease, we also deal with metabolic bone disease, which involves assessing a patient's calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and parathyroid hormone levels. Metabolic bone disease occurs due to the inability of the kidneys to produce active vitamin D and can result in higher risk of bone fractures and cardiovascular disease over time. Studies have shown that we do want to correct these parameters to more normal levels over time, though these are usually not issues that are emergently net need to be dealt with in the hospital. Unlike hyperkalemia or hypercalcemia, Hyperphosphatemia is usually a byproduct of diet and medication non-adherence and will not be immediately life-threatening. Management of these can be done over time with a low phosphorus diet and resumption or initiation of medications to lower phosphorus, such as phosphorus binders. So how does a lack of vitamin D cause so many issues with metabolic bone disease? The decrease in active vitamin D leads to lower gut absorption of calcium and the hypocalcemia combined with the low active vitamin D levels result in an increase in parathyroid hormone levels over time. Additionally, loss of nephron mass results in the body's inability to excrete phosphorus, leading to hyperphosphatemia in most dialysis patients. So in CKD and ESRD patients, it is not unusual to see the pattern of hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and secondary hyperparathyroidism, which can, can occur, could occur over time and affect bone and cardiovascular health. Now let's talk a bit about peritoneal dialysis. Most residents are exposed to peritoneal dialysis due to this presentation of peritonitis. Peritoneal fluids should remain clear and free of any cellular elements. When the drainage fluid, also known as effluent, has any cellular elements such as white blood cells, it becomes cloudy. Cloudy effluent is almost always synonymous with infection until proven otherwise. For patients who are coming in with a cloudy effluent to the hospital, we usually treat these with intraperitoneal antibiotics, though IV antibiotics can be used as a bridge until PD supplies can be obtained. A cell count and culture of the peritoneal dialysis fluid should always be drawn from the patient, and this helps us to confirm the diagnosis of peritonitis and eventually narrow our antibiotic therapy. Severe peritonitis may result in the PD catheter having to be removed and the patient transitioning to intermittent hemodialysis until the infection resolves. If you are unfamiliar with operating a PD catheter, it is best to leave it alone and allow trained dialysis nurses with additional supplies to collect fluid samples. It is never necessary to perform a paracentesis to remove peritoneal fluid from a PD patient, and as this may result in inadvertent puncturing of the dialysis catheter or introduction of additional infection risk. Similar to hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis relies on a semipermeable membrane for dialysis, in this case, our intestinal lining. Instead of applying a pressure gradient to remove fluid, we adjust the osmolarity of the peritoneal dialysis fluid by adjusting the sugar concentration to create an osmotic pressure gradient, which allows us to remove any excess fluid from the body. All patients are trained on both manual peritoneal dialysis, also known as continuous ambulatory or CAPD, as well as automated peritoneal dialysis, known as APD, using a cycler machine. These are what PD supplies look like. 
To the left, we have a standard PD cycler machine that can be programmed to instill a certain amount of fluid and then drain that fluid after a given amount of time. This allows patients to perform the dialysis treatments during their sleeping hours, especially since the PD treatments usually take upwards of about six to eight hours per day. The top of the machine is actually a warmer for dialysate bags to prevent vasoconstriction from cold dialysate being instilled into the abdomen. The right two pictures are pictures of the internal and external portions of the peritoneal dialysis catheter. Again, please do not open these catheters unless you have additional supplies and have been trained in aseptic PD catheter opening. You can always ask the patient to collect a fluid sample for you since all PD patients or their caregivers should be trained in this procedure. Let's go back to talking about hemodialysis and access. Many times our dialysis patients will be admitted to the hospital for dialysis access issues, especially clotted catheters, clotted fistulas, clotted grafts. These usually result in mistreatments and can potentially result in electrolyte abnormalities. We try to deal with most of these patients as an outpatient, but unfortunately it's sometimes faster to have the patient admitted for an emergent intervention. If it is in the middle of the night and you are having to deal with a patient without a working dialysis access, it is always beneficial to try medical management first with your preferred potassium binder. Please call us in either vascular or interventional radiology to assist with declotting or repairing the patient's dialysis access as soon as possible. Since dialysis is a life-sustaining treatment, dialysis accesses are a patient's lifeline and issues with the access should always be taken seriously. Patients usually have a fistular graft implanted in their arm, which is a connection between an artery and a vein that allows for a high flow and high caliber system to facilitate our dialysis treatment. The normal arteries and veins in our arm are usually too small to be accessible by placing needles three times a week. If a patient's vasculature is too small to accommodate for a native fistula, a graft or a Teflon tube can be implanted to facilitate this conduit between the artery and the vein. Here are the examples of catheters that we, you will probably become familiar with in the hospital. To the left, we have a tunneled or cuffed catheter, and to the right, the non-tunneled dialysis catheter that is usually placed in the hospital in the ICU setting for emergent dialysis. As with peritoneal dialysis catheters, please do not use or open these lines until you have appropriate supplies and are adequately trained to draw blood from them. Unlike normal IV lines, we typically instill heparin or TPA to prevent line clotting, and an accidental large bolus of these medications can be fatal to the patient. Now let's talk about the different dialysis modalities that we can use for critically ill patients. In addition to our normal intermittent hemodialysis, as we discussed earlier, we also have continuous renal replacement therapies, or CRRT, which is a form of continuous hemodialysis. This is useful in patients such as this one, who is critically ill on multiple pressors, since our usual intermittent hemodialysis can sometimes cause hypotension and hemodynamic stability in patients who are already critically ill. While the machines may look different, the theory behind all dialysis remains the same. To the left, we have a next stage CRT machine, which can also be used for home hemodialysis. To the right, we have the more complicated Phoenix intermittent hemodialysis machine. There are certainly more bells and whistles on the machine to the right, but interestingly, the, the outcomes for both um, intermittent and CRRT among critically ill patients is roughly the same. There are three main flavors of CRRT, which are CVVH or continuous venovenous hemofiltration, CVVHD or continuous venovenous hemodialysis, and CVVHDF or continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration. CVVH relies primarily on the principle of convection. CVVHD is most similar to our usual intermittent hemodialysis machines and primarily relies on the principle of diffusion. And CVVHDF is a combination of the two modalities. If there are really no benefits to CRT, then why do we choose CRT in the critical setting? This is primarily to reduce pressor needs as well as for better fluid balance. In CRRT, we target a continuous fluid removal over 24 hours, whereas in intermittent hemodialysis, that fluid removal is mandated to be on the time of dialysis, usually about three to four hours. You can imagine that if you need to take three liters of fluid from a patient, it'll be much easier to do that on the body and cause less hemodynamic instability if we had the entire day to remove that fluid versus a short three to four hour dialysis session. 
In patients with neurological injury and hepatic issues, CRRT also has the potential for improved effects compared to hemo intermittent hemodialysis. In the setting of toxic ingestions, though, intermittent dialysis is preferred due to faster clearance of the toxin compared to the continuous dialysis modalities that are less efficient due to the lower blood and dialysis flows that we typically use. It is also important to remember that needles should not be left in patients for longer than about five hours, which means that CRT mandates the use of a dialysis catheter, which is, can either be temporary or a tunnel dialysis catheter. Now let's talk about conservative management for patients who either elect not to transition to dialysis or who decide to withdraw from dialysis after a period of time. Most of these patients have a limited life expectancy, likely less than six months from the time we recommend dialysis initiation. In patients with severe renal failure, uremic symptoms of nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, itching, weight loss, and dysgeusia, or this metallic taste in the mouth, will usually develop. There are medications and treatments that we can use to make patients more comfortable, including oxygen for shortness of breath and air hunger, diphenhydramine or hydroxazine for itching, medical marijuana for nausea, loss of appetite and insomnia, and select opiates for pain control if necessary. Remember that not all patients want dialysis, though they should, we should always counsel them on the risk and benefits of starting and not starting dialysis to make sure they are making an informed decision. If patients are ambivalent, I always recommend a trial of dialysis before deciding to withdraw, since death is not usually a reversible condition. In addition to the medications I mentioned before, here are some other treatments that we can use to alleviate some of the symptoms patients may have close to the end of life among those with renal failure. Morphine and codeine are not recommended in late stage CKD or dialysis, since their metabolites of morphine 6 glucuronide is neurotoxic and can cause seizures in these patients. Let me just also briefly mention that patients who need antibiotics after their hospitalization and they're on dialysis, we can usually provide IV antibiotics with dialysis at many dialysis centers. This helps to avoid pick lines and also avoids using home health resources since we want to preserve any of the vasculature for future dialysis access and avoid unnecessary healthcare costs. Please feel free to reach out to any of us so we can arrange for IV antibiotics at their dialysis unit if necessary. Another brief aside on CT scans with contrast among dialysis patients. For the majority of patients with little to no urine output, it is usually reasonable to proceed with a CT scan with iodinated IV contrast. For those patients with significant residual urine output or who are on twice weekly dialysis, we recommend checking with us to see if an alternative imaging modality can be done since preservation of residual renal function is known to result in a better quality of life and improved outcomes. If the scan is needed emergently to save life or limb, please proceed accordingly. While we get a lot of calls regarding dialysis after CT scans, this is not necessary and only needs to be done in the setting of volume overload. The amount of CT contrast given is usually on the order of 1 to 200 cc's at most, so this is generally not an issue. The iodinated contrast usually causes vasoconstriction of the renal arteries almost immediately upon infusion, so dialyzing a patient does not help at preventing this side effect to IV contrast. For MRI scans, there is still a debate as to whether or not dialysis patients can get gadolinium agents. There is a definite correlation between the older group 1 gadolinium agents and nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or NSF, as you can see a picture of here on the right. So we do not recommend the use of group 1 agents among late stage CKD or dialysis patients. The newer group 2 agents have not been shown to cause NSF among dialysis patients. Those studies are limited for now. Please feel free to reach out to us if an MRI with contrast is necessary for your patient, and we can help you and the patient understand the risk and benefits of proceeding. In providing MRI with gadolinium contrast, it may be helpful to dialyze these patients afterwards to reduce the concentration of gadolinium over time and prevent known deposition of gadolinium in the body. To wrap up, I wanted to remind you all to call us for all dialysis patients that are admitted and who will not be discharged prior to their next dialysis treatment. Additionally, please feel free to call us if you anticipate any AKI patients needing dialysis in the near future. 
Remember that pharmacology for dialysis patients is different compared to CKD and non-CKD patients, so please dose antibiotics accordingly. Medications such as opiates and sedatives have a very long half-life in dialysis patients, so start low and go slow. Lastly, please help us preserve current and future dialysis access by not placing PICC lines, if possible, in our CKD-5 or ESRD patients. Thank you again for your attention, and please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions, comments, or consults.